Industry partnerships play a key role in high quality career technical education. The Enhancing Career Technical Education through Industry Partnerships modules are designed to provide the viewer with information on the importance of partnerships, how to create meaningful district advisory committees, engage local community and work-based learning, as well as market your needs to the community. The viewer will also learn more about the Visalia Partners in Education Advisory Committee, which plays a crucial role in the Visalia Unified School District's career and technical education pathways. Good morning, everybody. My name is Bill Davis. I'm with the Visalia Unified School District and happy to be here with you this morning. Uh, really wanted to start taking a look at why we do partnerships. We talk about partnerships a lot in education, especially as we start looking at work-based learning and how vital uh, partnerships are to our work and to um, making and building those experiences for our students. So when we look at why partnerships, you know, uh, the old television show Bosom Buddies, they had, there was a partnership. But was it the partnership that we're talking about today? Probably not. The partnerships we're looking at really come together between our industry partners and our schools and help support um, our work-based learning activities, whether those are guest speakers, job shadows, um, internship opportunities, or mentorships. Those are really the key um, to why we need partnerships. And a lot of times, we think about partnerships, we, we want to jump um, we want to jump right to the end of what a partner might want to do for us and really it is about building that relationship with our partners and about making sure that they know what we're doing and we know what they're able to do and, and then we kind of grow as we work through it. Um, a lot of times those partnerships come from our advisory committees and that's really where a lot of our partnerships begin. So as we go through today we'll talk about how vital an ad advisory committee is and how we can use them to support our programs and then build other partnerships um, within um, a particular industry sector or in particular community. Um, and then lastly, donations. You know, I think the old days, a lot of times that was what we, we sort of thought about. Um, we want, uh, we need this, let's call this partner and see if they'll donate it to us. Um, now we really want to step back about, less about what we need uh, material-wise and more about what we need in support of those partners um, in regards to those experiences. So um, again, coming into a classroom or hosting a job shadow event, those are much more vital. Um, and then project ideas, that's another big one. We are in the classroom as teachers and administrators, we're not out in the industry a lot. Um, teachers that have that industry experience have that opportunity and have that ability to, um, to know what is needed. But a lot of us have been out of the classroom for a while and we don't know how the industry may maybe has changed. So partners can bring um, project ideas, um, uh, ideas to the classroom that maybe we hadn't thought of before and in turn your students can and possibly do a very relevant real-world project that then in, uh, a partner would take and actually use in their company or it may just be a project that you do in your classroom and never goes any further but again our partners help us in so many different ways work-based learning um, helping with donations helping our uh, advisory committees and ultimately really helping to support our classes with projects and, and other great ideas so what does an educational partnership look like? You know, we, we talk about uh, partnerships a lot. Educational partnerships really that uh, educator and business person working together towards a shared goal designed to benefit students while at the same time achieving goals unique to each partner. I think in education we sometimes think it's a one-sided uh, relationship, that we are the ones that need and need and need. And so sometimes we're afraid to ask. And in reality, as we build those relationships with our partners, it may start out that way, but as we move forward, partners, partners will start to see where they're benefiting from this relationship. Um, for example, had an advisory committee uh, a year ago. We had a partner um, sitting at the table, and it was about an hour-long meeting. At the end, this partner um, just wanted to say, hey, I just wanted to share that your students in this uh, pathway are a blessing to me. And as a longtime educator, it kind of took me back a little bit. So I, I asked, what do you mean by that? And so uh, the, the partner explained that the students had been to their business and, it, and she was just there working, but had an opportunity to speak to them briefly, um, saw them in, their, in her company during an industry tour, and then at the World Ag Expo, about four months later, um, this company had a booth and she was there again, so the students saw her and, and recognized her 
had an opportunity to reconnect and, and um, stuck their hand out and um, talked with her and shook hands and, and talked about the booth and then she came in as a guest speaker and they welcomed her and uh, so, um, so happily, I guess, or so, uh, they were so welcoming, um, it just really warmed her heart and it made her uh, appreciate what she's doing, it made her appreciate the work she's doing now. Uh, and as I've shared with a lot of folks, companies would spend uh, thousands of dollars to get consultants to come in for people to help build um, enthusiasm and confidence and um, self-awareness and self-appreciation into their employees and this person got it for free by working with some students and so I don't think we sometimes realize the power um, that students have on on our partners and the experiences how they can affect our employees so that's really a, a huge so as we think about it it may start out one-sided and it may seem like we're asking a lot, but as we go, f as you move forward and you start interacting, or the partners start interacting with uh, your students in meaningful work-based learning events, um, the return on investment really starts to come out. So elements of a strong partnership. Collaborating as equals, um, they wanna be involved, they wanna be valued. If we just invite folks or we just call them up and say, I just need you to come and sit at a meeting to sit at a meeting, nobody wants to do that. Folks want to feel valued. They want to feel as if they are contributing, they're involved. They may not be able to do everything, but they want to be involved where they can, even if it's just to recommend someone else. So folks want to be involved. They want to be considered an equal, not talked down to, um, and not, not treated as somebody different, um, but just as part of the team. Bring them together and ask their questions. They may not understand all the educational jargon, but bring them together, try to cut out some of the acronyms that we use in education and focus directly on what the work is ahead. And a lot of times that's what they want. They want to be involved, they want to feel connected. Um, you want to have a shared interest, a common shared interest in the work that you're doing. Um, hopefully your partners are interested in, in partnering with you. If they're not, they probably won't be at the table anyway. But if they have a particular interest and maybe that's not the direction you're going, it may be challenging at times. But figuring those pieces out and figuring out how they come together will be really key. So having that shared interest is key. Partners bring something to the table. Of course they do. They have the experience. They have the companies. They have the employees. They have the, the physical structures that you're going to tour possibly um, and potentially job shadow and maybe do internships in with your students. So it is critical um, that they, they have something. They bring something to the table. But then you bring something to the table too. You have the students and that's what they are there to work with. So there is a shared interest, both are bringing something to the table. And then how are we gonna measure it? What are our outcomes? So as we look at, to our partners, um, knowing what you're trying to achieve, sharing your goals. If it's you want um, out of 30 students, you want 10 of them to have a job shadow experience, then that's your goal. And what is, you know, what is your outcome going to be? Um, are you trying to uh, build a specific experience for your students or is it just whatever happens, happens? So those are the things that your partners can help you um, build and plan. They can, it can also help you avoid going down a path uh, of a bad experience. If you know what the outcome is and you've articulated that with your partner and they're aware of it, then a lot of times your experience will be a lot more successful for the student and the partner because it's very clear expectations, just like a classroom, just like you would do a lesson. What is your expectation? Same thing for our partners in work-based learning. So I use this example a lot and I think it's very uh, apropos to where we are now in education. For years we started out at the top kind of identifying the problem. So we would get together as teachers and figure out here's a challenge, here's a situation, here's something we need to deal with. And then in our own little group we would say well we need to get some partners together or maybe I need to buy this piece of equipment or I need um, something from this person and then we would go find the person. And it was really kind of after the fact. The, the person was actually the solution not really part of the solution, they were the solution. And, and that works at, at times. But when you really are building a partnership, it's about building it with your folks. And so we've really kind of tried to flip this thing on its head and really find your partners. And so that's where you have possibly an advisory committee already in place. And so as, as situations come up or challenges with curriculum or maybe changes in equipment or administration, how do you deal with those um, and how do you deal with them with your partners? Not in a separate meeting, not by yourself and then come tell the partners what you want them to do, but bring it up with them and talk about it. Um, prime example, we had an advisory committee a few years ago, um, very early in, in this very young advisory committee, but the teacher said, I really would like um, eight 
guest speakers. And so um, eight guest speakers seemed manageable, so she brought it to the advisory committee. Now she could have done it all on her own and tried to organize it, but she said, you know what, let me, let me bring this to them and get their input. Really not a problem, more of, a, of a, an opportunity. And so we brought it to the advisory. She said, I would like eight. Well, one of the folks in the advisory said, eight's gonna be really hard. I don't think we can do that. The chair, on the other hand, said, eight seems kind of small. I think we could do 12. What do you guys think? And so around the table, everybody started talking. Unfortunately, this one lady was sort of uh, left out of the conversation, and she eventually came around to it. But by bringing the partners to the table, we could have had maybe no guest speakers, but in the end, we wanted eight, we got 12 um, committed, and in actuality, they ended up with 15 during the year because the partners were so engaged, um, and it was sort of a, an ongoing conversation throughout the year. Well, how many, are we, how many have we had so far? Hey, we reached our 12, we still have a couple more months. Do we have more opportunities? And we brought more in. So it's bringing the partners around the table to help find that solution, find the answer, and then move forward and design the solution and, and, and do it. And so we really need to think about this with our advisory committees and our partners when we meet with them, is what is that problem? And instead of having the answer all ready to go, let them think about it, let them work on it, because they have a, a whole different mindset than you do sometimes. Field of Dreams, great movie. Uh, the whole premise of that movie, and everybody talks about it still today, is if you build it, they will come. Uh, I equate that to our advisory committees. If you build a strong advisory committee that has a purpose, has a goal, and has people actively involved, they will come. They will come every time you meet, they will be engaged, they will be ex excited to be there. So building uh, and maintaining a meaningful advisory committee is crucial. So what does that look like? So why, first off, why do we even have advisory committees? Who's in there? Um, what do they do? How do you engage them? We get them to the meeting, but then how do we ask those questions? And then what are our outcomes are for our advisory? And so as Arsenio Hall used to say, things that make you go, hmm. And that's one of those things that makes us all go, hmm. Because for years we've done advisory committees, um, sometimes um, successfully and sometimes maybe not so successfully. So if you look at legislation uh, and things like Carl Perkins and a little thing called the Ed Code and the new CT incentive grant, it says you have to have an advisory committee. It's part of our work. Um, and as I work with teachers across my district and across the state, um, I find that some are very passionate, very excited about their advisory committees and some, some are a little less excited um, and not quite sure how to tackle that, that monster. And so uh, as we look at advisory committees, know it's something that's expected, um, and it's expected for a reason, because that's that industry connection. As teachers, we can very easily lose track of our industry or lose touch with our industry by being consumed with all the educational jargon and initiatives that are coming at us all the time. We, some, we can very easily lose track of our industry, and that's why advisory committees are so crucial and so vital to our work. So who's in there and where do we find them? So we look a lot of times for industry leaders and I like to call them the movers and shakers. It's great to have an employee of a company, but if you can have somebody higher up, maybe a general manager. If it's a large company, um, maybe not the, the owner, but somebody just below that. Or if it's a small company, possibly owner. We, in our district, we, we have a, a very um, active, automotive advisory. We have uh, four automotive programs in our district and so we work with a large company that has multiple dealerships but we also work with independent dealer uh, shops and so sometimes we're working with a manager, sometimes we're working with the owner, but those are the folks that can get your your message out and can make things happen within their own company. So movers and shakers are great even just in a particular industry. It may not even be tied to a particular company, just an industry. Community leaders um, it's great to have folks from the city, city managers, um, high-ranking officials in the city, um, folks from your college, if you have a, a local college that can work with you. Um, uh, those kind of folks are great. Uh, retired, a lot of times we think, well, they're retired, so maybe we don't want to invite them to an advisory committee. But sometimes in, retired folks are great because they have possibly still a connection to their business or to their industry, but they're not tied down with a job, so they're a little more flexible. So that's a great opportunity as well. Um, association executive directors. So Farm Bureau, uh, we work with our Economic Development Corporation here in Visalia, Chamber of Commerce, those kind of organizations. If you, builders associations, um, those types of organizations. We also have an Hispanic chamber 
here in Visalia that we work closely with. So those sorts of organizations, those are great places. As I said, Chamber of Commerce, your Workforce Investment Board. Do you have somebody from your Workforce Investment Board that sits on maybe not your individual advisory committees uh, by industry sectors, but maybe an overall district advisory? But those are great people to have access to. And a lot of your Workforce Investment Boards have um, uh, industry sector committees, and so especially for those key sectors in your region. So having one of those folks sit on an industry advisory may be very helpful. As we said, economic development, hospitals. We have a hospital here in Visalia, Cahuilla Delta. Um, we have folks from that hospital that sit on our committees um, and are very active. City administration, as I mentioned, utilities. We've had folks from Calwater and uh, the gas company, um, Edison, those are great folks to have, and of course government agencies if possible. So really it's, it's kind of a wide gamut. We really don't tell anybody to not, uh, that we don't ever say don't invite somebody to an advisory, um, but we, we encourage you to, to aim for these types of folks if possible because it really does, um, again, those movers and shakers that can help you get things going. Um, roles of an advisory, you know, there's been, um, there's multiple publications out there, what advisories do help determine which CT programs, uh, what offer, what's going to be offered in your district, uh, assist teachers with work-based learning, um, serve as guest speakers, review curriculum, uh, facilities, the list goes on and you can see it there. Um, it really is limited to your, to your imagination and to what you're trying to do in your program. It may be one meeting may be talking about the curriculum. Next meeting, you may be talking about work-based learning. Um, you may have a cycle where in the fall you look at curriculum and then changes are made throughout the year and then we review it again in the fall. Maybe a particular meeting is facilities. Maybe every meeting you're talking about the need for guest speakers and work-based learning activities in your program. So whatever it may be, it, it's really not limited. It could be a one-time situation where we have an opportunity to, opportunity to do something, a one-time event, how do, we, how do we do that? And your advisory can help you with that. Um, you know, I remember in the past uh, teaching a class, uh, we wanted to take a, a group of students to Sacramento for an ag, ag government class. And uh, we talked about it, and then within the advisory, a couple members got together, and they helped us plan it, they helped us lay out the day, they got us um, uh, meetings with some very high-ranking folks in agriculture and at the Capitol and, and uh, around Sacramento, and it turned out to be a great um, experience. We never had the, the, the conversation again. We didn't do the trip again, but we did it with that one group of students because of a particular situation, um, and then we never did it again. So you're gonna have those kind of one and done opportunities with your advisory. So again, keep it open and, and always be thinking about how you can be working with your partners, how you can include them in your work. So how do we engage? As we said, you know, reviewing curriculum is, is key. If you're a program that has a, a facility, whether it's a shop or a farm or something, um, even your classrooms, taking them around and having them review that. You know, sometimes partners will, will realize, hey, you have, you have higher or newer programs than I do, or you have better equipment than I do, or maybe you don't have good, the best equipment. We may want to look at how we can help you get this or that. So reviewing facil facilities is huge. Reviewing data. Sometimes partners don't appreciate school data when we look at ELA and math rates, but they do care about it. And, and those that are really engaged will want to know well, why, why are students doing uh, maybe poorly or why are they doing well in these particular areas. So reviewing data is, is key. Don't exclude them from school-related um, data or school-related activities or business, um, but we just don't want to make that everything that they do. But letting them know where your students are. How are your students matching up against other students in the school um, and the pathway or academy experience that you're providing is having these benefits. Um, those are great conversations to have. Obviously reviewing curriculum and then the last one really is working with work-based learning. How do we, how can they help you with work-based learning? Have a plan, have a list of things. As I said before, um, they wanted eight guest speakers. That's something you bring to an advisory and you say we would like to have eight guest speakers can you support us in that work? They'll say, yeah, we support you. And then most of them will say, well, what does support mean? And then that's where you say, well, we kind of need help. We have some folks that would be interested in this. We think some of you might be great guest speakers and it may not work for everybody. And so how, uh, how they support may look differently. Some may say, I'll come in and speak or hey, I can send somebody or I know a guy who knows a guy, uh, that old story. 
but you get to a point where they begin to understand uh, what, what you need and how they can help. So where do we find them? We talked about that already a little bit. But to start, if you're looking for partners to help with uh, particular things like job shadows or guest speakers, like we said, your advisory committee is a great place to start. Um, reach out to your business organizations. If you need a, um, an in electrical engineer, maybe reach out to another partner that does construction. I bet they probably know an electrical engineer. Your own district is great, because a lot of times, like in our district, we're fairly large. We'll do something, uh, we'll, do, um, we'll need a guest speaker, but our, and we don't know who to ask, our district probably works with somebody in one of those fields. Um, industry associations, as we've said, again, alumni, parents, and so on. Um, again, that circle of, uh, that sphere of influence, you know, who are those really close people? And then how, who do I start tapping or who do I reach out to at this level, that level, next level? Again, not all of your partners are always going to be advisory members. Sometimes you'll have great partners and they may not be on an advisory committee. That's not where they can serve at this point, but they're great. They're a great guest speaker, or they host a really awesome, relevant job shadow experience, um, or they can help with an industry tour. So not everybody is going to be an industry part or um, an advisory committee member. Some of them may just be a partner in a particular activity. So those are great folks to have, but never, never close the door on an opportunity or a potential partner. You never know, and they don't know because a lot of times they don't know how they can help. So sometimes just explaining, telling your story about your district and what you're trying to do or your pathway or academy and what you're trying to do. Just sharing that story a lot of times will help folks find a place where they can fit if they really want to be a part of it. Remember, um, as I said, your advisory doesn't have to do it all, um, but ask them for additional partners. Ask your advisory for those, help, those folks. Um, they have business associates, they have vendors, they have folks they sell to. They have folks they buy from. They have friends from a Kiwanis or a Rotary group. They know, they know people because that's what they do. And most business folks really do know how to network and they do it well. In education, we don't sometimes network very well. So have them reach out. Another big one is we sometimes think of organizations in, in one dimension. So for example, a hospital, we say, well, it's healthcare. But what goes into healthcare? There's nutritional services, there's HR, human resources, there's accounting. There's business management, there's engineering and construction and maintenance, um, on and on and on. So there's a ton of different um, industries represented in that one company and we sometimes forget that there are other facets of that organization. So for example, Quia Delta here, we have students that do work in the health side and they do rehabilitation, uh, work with our re rehab folks, they do nursing, et cetera, um, experiences, but then they also have folks that work with uh, information technology people. We have students that are going to start working with our nutritional, the nutritional services folks. Um, and your school district is very similar. If you think about your district, you have budget, you have finance, you have facilities, you have nutrition, uh, maintenance, uh, uh, transportation, um, and those are all folks that you can tap um, to help you out with experiences or be a guest speaker. And working for a, an educational institution um, doesn't mean you're in teaching, it might mean you're in transportation or you're uh, a diesel mechanic, but you still work in education. And that's another facet that students don't always realize. So once you have your organization, you have your advisory, you have your partners, how do you engage them? Um, a lot of times we work so hard or we're so worried about getting our committee or our uh, board together we forget what is the work that they're going to do. So just as teachers, we don't want to go to a meeting um, and sit and listen to somebody talk about something we really don't need to do. Partners don't have that kind of time. They're very busy. They have, um, they have jobs, obviously. They have responsibilities to their companies and their families. So being very um, clear with what you're looking for is going to be key. So as we engage, um, first thing is you have to share your vision. And, and that really is, is a challenge for some folks, but stepping back and really figuring out what is the vision, what are you trying to create? And you have to think big. Um, you have to think of what's the best thing that could possibly happen with this group. What could we accomplish? Not all the challenges and things that can't happen, but what could we do if, if everything came together and all the stars aligned, what could we accomplish? So that's the big thing. Share your vision. What do you want to accomplish? How are your partners going to help? Are they directly 
going to do the work? Is that the expectation? Are they a part of the work? Are they promoting the work? Um, a lot of times you may never have a partner that steps foot in a classroom, but they're there talking about your work. They're sharing it at um, service club organizations. They're, they're sharing it with other uh, folks. They're sh sharing it over dinner and drinks with friends. Um, and they're talking about it and letting folks know the good work that's happening in your school and in your program. So that's key. Um, message with the appropriate people. Are you sharing it with the right folks, your vision? Um, whatever that vision may be. Are you sharing it with your city? If you don't share it with your city, and, and we sort of had that experience a little bit here in Visalia, we, we had shared our vision and done quite a bit, and then we realized we really didn't have the city engaged and realized we were missing out on a key partner. When we brought the city to the table, uh, tremendous amount of opportunities have opened up since in a number of different areas, public safety, um, even engineering. Our students working with engineering uh, folks from the city um, and other firms that work with the city, um, just being around the city manager and administration of the city, uh, all of those pieces can be very helpful. So don't forget your city folks in this work. Um, county government. Um, we just recently opened a Law and Justice Academy at one of our high schools and we work very closely with our county courthouse. Um, there's an administrator from the courthouse that sits on the advisory. So students have had an opportunity to see a side of the courthouse not a lot of folks get to see. Um, the other part of it is that they've been invited into special events and they're not there just to watch, they're there as a special guest of the courthouse, which is a great honor for our students and really um, makes them feel important and more engaged in the work they're doing. And as we mentioned, economic development, that's key. So again, businesses, when they're coming to your community, they look at, the, at your education system. They look at what type of schools you have, what type of programs you offer. Do you have intermediary organizations, intermediary organizations that can help with uh, work-based learning and those pieces? So um, having those uh, pieces and having those conversations with your economic development folks helps them promote your, your program to other companies and other businesses. Um, and also potential companies that are coming to the area. And those programs may be that factor that helps pull a company into your community or not. And then lastly, as we said, business leaders. You want those people that are, are making decisions, those people that are engaged, those people that are at the city council meetings, those people that sit on the economic development uh, boards. Those are the folks that you want to understand what you're doing because at the end of the day, when you need help, they're going to be the ones that are going to um, share your message um, and so keep those things in mind as you're as you're building this vision make a list of those folks and again a lot of times we may not know who that person is but it's as easy as a simple uh, web search uh, or to ask somebody uh, about uh, you know a particular organization and who to call um, that's those are key um, outcomes do you have outcomes for your district and if you do those are a great uh, message to share with your partners uh, partners want to know what our students can do. They have a business, um, they have uh, a bottom line that they're trying to meet, and they want to know that they have a strong workforce coming. They have situations currently with their, with their current workforce that they're trying to work through. So how do we, um, how can we better help them with their business and prepare our students for that, for their jobs? And so um, having your advisory committees or your, your partners review your outcomes. Are those in line with what you need? Um, some cities have done uh, needs assessments through economic development groups, uh, needs assessment for your community, and a lot of them will come back around soft skills, career readiness, um, not so much on the skilled labor, that's, that's key, but a lot of employers just want those career ready skills. By being able to share possibly your outcomes, whatever they may be, um, that's key. Also, as you're building your outcomes, it's great to, to do it as an educational organization, but it's even better when you can share that process <clears throat> with business people and get their input because they'll have a different um, take on things than we will in education. So sharing your vision is really key. So return on investment, that's what a lot of companies look for. So what is the return on investment to your partner? Is it advertising? When you have a work-based learning activity or you do an industry tour, does somebody take pictures and write it up send it to the newspaper? Do you invite the newspaper out? Do you do a press release? Um, when you do an event, do you promote it? Um, or do you have a web blast um, or a newsletter or end up in a chamber newsletter? So advertising the ways your partners help you helps them because then other folks start reading and they realize, wow, they're not just a good company, 
they're also partnering with the schools and look what they're doing here and sometimes that's a deciding factor on them. Internal leadership development. A lot of times companies are looking for those next leaders in their company and by mentoring a student or working with a student one-on-one -on -one in a job shadow, a lot of partners can get that initial feel for if that person has that coaching uh, spirit, they have that skill set, they have that ability and maybe we want to invest in them in future leadership opportunities within our company. So it's, it's a good sort of a testing ground sometimes for some of our leaders. Um, that's key. Potential employees. You have a great young student uh, come in for a job shadow and then maybe they intern and then maybe there's summertime work that they can do and you actually hire them. Or uh, they graduate and they go away to college but they come back during the summers and you hire them for the summers to do internship work from through colleges. Um, so there's a lot of different opportunities. We have a, a wonderful partnership with one of our automotive uh, dealers here in town, the Grappetti Automotive Group, and they uh, take students for a year, and we go every other week for about five hours a day, and they start out rotating around to different shops and different aspects, so sales and service, parts and service. Um, and then at the semester, the students pick one area and they stay there for the entire semester going deeper in that particular area. So they may work in the service department for six months every other week for, for five hours. And then at the end of it, students apply for a um, month-long internship in a particular dealership. Uh, and at the end, we've had students that finish the internship and go on to college. Uh, two years ago, they had three interns and all three of them were hired full-time to work in the shop. So it's an opportunity for partners to really get a first-hand uh, look, kind of a long-term interview uh, with a potential student and potential employee. And then the feel-good factor. As I mentioned earlier, you had a, an employee for a particular company that felt blessed. That's, that's again, that's, uh, uh, you can't value that. You can't really put a, a number on it, but it's such a great um, return on investment for your partners. They, they sometimes forget that. Um, it's fun to see when we do have an industry tour and everybody will turn their focus to the students and they get excited and they clean up or they, uh, they get it ready and they're engaged and they're excited about the kids being there and then the conversation just carries on for days about how great it was when the kids were here, what a great opportunity we had. Um, so those things are the feel good piece of it and we have it in, in our schools, in our classes when something good happens uh, with a lesson. Um, but a lot of times uh, partners don't have those uh, all the time uh, in their companies and so this is an opportunity to do something and bring that feel-good aspect. So once you've designed, uh, once you've designed your plan and you have a, um, a vision and a direction you're going, how do you get it out to the community? How do you market um, what you're trying to do? Whether it's work-based learning, uh, particular program development, whatever that might be, how do you message that to the community and get them behind you? Um, so there's a, a couple different ways um, that you can do that. For us, what we found was really, this was really our, the best way for us is, is create a team. So in Visalia, back probably in 2002, an organization was formed uh, to support career technical education and that was called Visalia Partners in Education, uh, VPI for short. So VPI was created back in 2002 to support uh, vocational education. Uh, it was sort of tied to the Chamber of Commerce. Um, there were activities, uh, business engagement activities where uh, business partners came into schools and did workshops and did um, lessons with students about being ready for work and what does it mean to go to work, um, uh, finding jobs, resume building, etc. At the same time, there was a financial commitment. So in VPI, it was a hundred. It was a three hundred thousand dollar commitment. One hundred and fifty thousand from our business partners of in-kind time and donations, monetary donations, and then one hundred and fifty thousand in general fund um, allocation from our school board. So that started in two thousand two. Well, a few years into Visalia Partners in Education, um, the work grew and grew, and change in leadership at certain organizations. The work started to sort of fall away and eventually the community side sort of went away. Um, the community always supported, but the activity sort of ended. The conversations became farther and few between. Um, but at the, on the other side, the education side, <clears throat> Visa Unified was still committed to $150,000 general fund donation. <clears throat> so you had teachers who may not have been around in 2002 
that were getting this VPI money and really had no idea what VPI meant. And so four years ago when I became director for career and technical education in Visalia, we had this goal of establishing link learning academies, uh, revitalizing and supporting our uh, career pathways and we started thinking we really need to engage our partners how do we do that so we went back to VPI we had a structure that had worked really well we had a known um, kind of a known uh, group of folks that had been involved so we went back to those same folks some of them retired now some of them still active uh, and then we also went to new members in the community, younger members in the community that may not have been a part of the first VPI, but were active, again, those movers and shakers, young leaders that we thought would be great, a great help. So we reached out to those folks um, and invited them to, the, uh, to be a part of the, the new VPI, uh, Visalia Partners in Education. We extended that invitation out to our Chamber of Commerce, Economic Development. Uh, we have our Tulare County Farm Bureau because agriculture is such a key industry here in our area. Um, we have the city of Visalia that sits on the advisory committee. Those are all members that have a voting position on the committee. And so they actually help make decisions. Um, they vote on, on pieces. We have a chair, uh, Mr. Matt Seals, and a co-chair, uh, Mr. Steve Reed. And they both um, help kind of facilitate the meetings. But we also have other folks, education folks, that sit on it. So, of course, I sit on the committee. We have board members that sit on the committee, school board members, and we also have uh, district folks like our superintendent, um, possibly our assistant superintendent will attend. It just depends on, on everybody's schedule. But we're there really to listen and learn from our advisory folks. And uh, Visalia Partners in Education is sort of our umbrella organization uh, or our umbrella advisory committee over all of the other advisory committees in our district. So they may say we're going to do a particular event and then we share that down into our other advisories and then as other things come up from our advisory committees, our individual uh, industry advisories, we bring those to the, uh, to the larger Visalia Partners in Education group. Um, they've helped us in a lot of ways plan events. We, we did our kind of our launch event this past fall. We called it our Futures Project in Visalia Unified. Our mission is we create futures. That's what we do. And so Visalia Unified, in partnership with Visalia Partners in Education, launched our um, Futures Project. So looking at engaging our business community in work-based learning, whether it's a guest speaker or a job shadow or an internship, how can our community be a part of our um, students' education and help build futures? And so that was really our work. And VPI, our committee, was uh, very active in, in that process, helping us plan it out helping us message it correctly for our business partners. Again, we're in education, so sometimes we don't necessarily message things the best way. We message things in an educational way. Business partners need something a little cleaner, um, a little shorter, a little more to the point sometimes. And so they've really been able to help us um, do that. Um, they've helped us with production of videos about our organizations. They help us with donation of food for events. Sometimes. People need to eat, and we've found when you have a meeting at lunchtime, um, partners have to have lunch, and so they'll be there um, just because it fits into their schedule. And so being able to, to help support that because a lot of our funding is uh, limited when it comes to food budgets. Um, and then having those district folks on hand, it's great to have, if you're the director of, an, of a particular program, it's great for you to hear the message, but a lot of times we already know the message. It, you know, I talk to these folks a lot in different settings. It's good for your district folks, your board members and district administration to be a part of these conversations, whether it's at uh, a principal, at a, a department advisory committee, or a superintendent or assistant superintendent at a district-wide advisory committee. To hear the message from your partners is key. So make sure that those folks are there and that they're able to uh, be a part of the event. So, for example, here was a, a lunch meeting we had just recently. Uh, we uh, recognize 10 partners every year. We started this about three years ago. We have a lunch event um, in conjunction with our uh, link learning recruitment events. And so we invite partners in. The first year was really just to say, hey, this is what we're doing. Here's our event. Here's our, um, here's our, our academies. This is what we're doing. Year two, we actually started recognizing outstanding partners. So those folks that 
you know, took a lead in an advisory committee or really took charge of an event and ran with it, we recognize those. This last year uh, in January, we recognized 10 partners. We had a really nice lunch. We gave them a nice plaque. We're able to um, um, speak to their, to their support and their partnership and really recognize them. Again, um, as a director of CTE, I'm a Visa Unified employee, and, and so we're only a piece of the Visalia Partners in Education organization. We aren't the organization. It's a partnership, and it's an organization of, of business and industry. And so, for example, our chair obviously does the welcome. Our uh, executive director of the Chamber of Commerce, she helped with the awards. Our su superintendent did a, a brief welcome from our district and thanked folks for their participation in our work. So again, it's really a community. It's not about Visalia Unified doing something. It's about the Visalia Partners in Education uh, running these events. And so as we move forward, uh, the, the lunch on January 19th was one example. Um, even the flyer that you see um, was designed by our Chamber of Commerce to help uh, as part of their work with VPI. So they help in with building marketing materials. Other, uh, we have a folder that, about Visalia Partners in Education that we can give to partners when they, when they want to partner up with us. Um, that was designed by one of our uh, VPI members from a marketing company. So those folks help in a number of different ways so that we have a clear, clean message. We have a professional looking message and we're doing it in a way that our business community can relate. Um, another event, I mentioned the launch event that we did, our Futures Project. Uh, again, this was all student because it was more focused on the Visalia Unified and our programs. Um, we had student presenters. Um, I'm very happy to say I didn't speak at this event. Um, our superintendent was actually introduced by a student and then he introduced some students and they introduced um, one of our partners, Drew Kanoi from Cuya Delta, who uh, is just a fantastic partner and has been working with us for almost uh, 15 years now uh, with Visalia Partners in Education. Um, and so she spoke to the to group to be able to speak directly to our partners t about the return on the, uh, the return on the investment, the benefit of work-based learning, the benefit of engaging with schools and partnering with Visalia Unified. So having these organizations, um, um, having this type of organization in your community, you know, ours is Visalia Partners in Education. You may have something else um, and you may have individual industry advisory committees, but sometimes it's good, especially if you really want a movement to happen community-wide, not just within your own district, but community-wide, is to reach broader. And sometimes it's just reaching out to some of those key folks. It doesn't have to be a big group of those folks that can kind of help you think on a bigger scale, how do I message what I'm trying to do for our students here in, in, in our community? And um, what better way to do that than to reach out to the community and, and more specifically our business community. Many years ago, VPI was a part of my life and it was called something totally different. And I got involved because I had a small business and I wanted to get involved with getting education and my business together. And uh, it was through the chamber. We have a fabulous chamber in Visalia, and it was through the chamber that I got involved. And I think that the future of our community lies in our kids. And so involving my business with kids was very, very important so that I could expose them to what I was doing. And at that time, it was a bronze art foundry, but it was bringing kids in, giving them an experience they wouldn't have any other way and not ever having that opportunity. So I think that VPI offers kids the opportunity to come in and see the real world at work, the real business world. Um, we ask kids to go to school, but they need to understand how that's relevant to what they're going to be doing in the future. I think the mission of VPI is connecting businesses to the um, commodity of kids so that they can see firsthand what's available and know the um, kind of kids they're looking for for their business. It's a peek at what the opportunities are, who's, who's the, uh, the commodity they can bring into their business, take a little peek at it and see if it's worthwhile, and give these kids the opportunity to see their businesses. So I think it's bringing the two together. 
At Quia Delta, we have a MAP program, which is a medical assistance apprentice program, and it is fabulous. We bring these kids in, and they have spend a whole week getting exposed to every aspect of the healthcare system, whether it's a physical therapy approach, whether they get a, um, a little peek at the IT program, nursing, they get to get uh, marketing. We went in with our marketing department, gave them a little overview of marketing. So they would understand every aspect of business that's in a hospital, because for us, a hospital is many, many businesses under one roof. And so we have brought the kids in. Now we have an apprentice program where the kids come in. They spend time in the hospital. They're working on our floors. They're volunteering there. Uh, we had kids come in over the summer who worked in our IT program and got to support the IT guys. They put in all kinds of um, electrical pieces that otherwise they would never see the insides of the halls of the hospital unless they walked through the ED. So um, kids have always said, I want to be a doctor. I want to do this. How do they know? How, they watch too much TV. You know? How do they know what's really happening there? So we're able to bring those kids into our business and allow them a real hands-on uh, view of what goes on in the business of the hospital, whether it's in the finance department or whether it's in the uh, emergency department. In the medical profession, it's more difficult because of HIPAA compliance. So if you can work through their um, human resources, which is exactly what we did. Um, Bill Davis and I went in um, because we're passionate and we're pushy and went into the HR department and said, we have an idea and how can we do this? And so what they were able to do is use their um, program by which they get nurses to come in on um, apprentice programs there, use that same kind of model to get the kids to be able to come in. We put the kids through all the processes we do of a, t a volunteer program, so like our guild and all those folks. So if you treat it like a, a volunteer program and use those same kind of guidelines, you can get these kids approved to come in. And you, you, it's a process. It took us a while, but it, it's really worthwhile because we had kids that uh, years ago we had a um, a, a young uh, candy striper program, and it had gone away, but same thing. The kids had the opportunity to come in, so we were able to reestablish that kind of concept by going back and, and setting it up this way. You have to be tenacious because it's really easy for us in the healthcare district to go, I'm sorry, we have HIPAA rules, so you can't come in. But there really are lots of ways to bring the kids in, and, and it's basically do, being willing to do the paperwork. Um, just like anything, there's a lot of paperwork. We have to do, we put the kids through an orientation just like they were becoming an employee. So they spend a day in orientation. Uh, that's part of the commitment. They fill out an application. So they do everything like they were applying for a job, and yet they're going to come in on an intern basis. Well, I love it because I love seeing the energy of these kids and what they really know and being able to expose them to what we're doing. Um, I think from a business point of view, the advantage to me is having the opportunity, say you have six kids who really say they, and I'm going to use marketing even though I'm in the healthcare because I'm in the marketing department, but I've had a lot of kids come in and intern with me and I get to say, you know, there's a future employee. This person, we had a young gal come in and she says, you know, I, I really love to do charts and stuff and I needed an analysis done. I just gave her the work. She went out and did a whole Excel analysis, did charts and bar charts and graphs and, and came back and presented me this, the most beautiful report that I would never have generated on my own because I would never have taken that time. I thought, here's a potential young person that if she put her application in, I'd hire in a moment. And I've had these kids come back and put in applications, and yes, it's awesome. So you get to see firsthand, you know, the cream of the crop. So I think it's great for business that way. Also, it gives us an opportunity to know what we need educators to know. Um, there are so many times that we get complaints from business saying, you know, these kids are not coming in here educated. The school district isn't doing a good job. 
No, I would challenge that and say, no, we businesses are not doing a good enough job educating our educators about what we need the kids to come out knowing. So here's our opportunity to say, partner with the schools, say these are the kinds of things we need these kids to do. And you know, on the other side of it, they'll go, yeah, but we don't have that equipment. And I know in this community, those businesses have stepped up, put that equipment into the schools so the kids come out trained and ready to go to walk into the workforce. Uh, the Visalia Chamber of Commerce became involved in the Visalia Partners in Education because what we were hearing from our members, from businesses, is that there really was a gap. They wanted to create a pipeline of the next wave of employees, but when they were interviewing those people, when they were bringing them on board, they lacked the skills that they wanted them to have. And they said, gosh, I really wish that educators knew this was happening in my industry. Or if I could tell these students how to engage with my business better, I think they'd be better applicants and ultimately better employees. And so for us at the chamber, filling that gap and uh, creating that pathway for the employers to educate and influence the way that education is being taught and to affect their next generation of workers is the reason that we are involved. VPI for us and VPI for other people is a place as a community to come and have a voice, uh, to have a vote, and, and to have influence. Um, it's an opportunity for us to affect the future and as business leaders for us to, to create an investment that's going to pay dividends not only for our business but for our community for decades to come. So that really is, um, while we gather for lunch and we talk about what's happened, um, in the last quarter, it's really an opportunity for us to dream about the type of community that we want to have, the type of employees that we want to have, and to think strategically about how we get those students to become those employees. The Chamber's involvement, I think, um, it's f about creating that uh, value uh, for members. Uh, when they join the Chamber, they want to have uh, value for their business, and for them, this influence and, and that ability to affect the leadership and the um, workforce that they have is important. For me personally, one of the things that I really enjoy is when I get to watch a member have an aha moment. Uh, we had a member who was challenged to have interns. And as they were sitting there thinking, there's not a way for me to have interns, uh, Bill Davis uh, said, there's got to be something that's on your back plate, something you've always wanted to do, you just don't have time. And he thought for a minute and said, well, actually, there is. Uh, there's this project that I've been looking at the way that we've been contracting services and creating bids um, and the way that we bid and versus the final contract and what the percentage differences is. And that could affect the way that we bid going forward. And Bill says, I think that sounds like an internship project. Um, and further, you could have that internship be year over year because what this year's interns find might be different than what the next year's interns find and giving those students that creativity to give the data and to say, give me your findings is important. Uh, so for me, watching that aha moment where that employer went, I can do this and that's gonna be exciting, um, created an internship where there wasn't one. And that's, that's the way that this happens. Sure, I think one of the things that is beneficial for students to be involved with um, as far as job shadows or, or mentorship, is really to see the classroom come alive. Um, I've read books, um, I've even watched videos, but being there in person changes your perception of things. The same is true for our students. Um, we all have businesses that are unique and different, and having those students come and experience that, there's some pride um, that you get to share what you get to do. The best businesses, though, are open for those students' reflections. They see things in a way that we don't see. We're there every day. This is our business for many businesses. This is something they've done for decades. And to be able to have that high school student say to them, why, why did you do it this way? Or could you have done it that way? Um, those are important questions for business to ask, and often we don't have the opportunity to do that, and the students provide that. So initially, that feel good that you give to students is important, but I challenge employers all the time to make sure that you're getting out of the students that perspective that becomes so valuable for business as well. 
You know, as Chambers, we talk a lot about um, creating value without involvement. It's certainly a buzzword in our industry. And as we look at ways for us to affect our community, workforce development is a powerful place for us as a chamber to be. There is no more powerful workforce development than developing our students and creating that value for our members without the involvement of going to a mixer or a ribbon cutting. Nothing against those things, but these are the things that are going to influence their business for generations, and it's a place uh, that the chamber should be um, connecting and providing those um, opportunities for our members. Thank you.